So we've learned the principles underlying special relativity. We learned that physical laws are identical in all inertial reference frames, and that one of those physical laws is that the speed of light is constant. Now from those two principles, we can derive all of the special relativity that we've learned. And in order to make all our mathematics easy, we introduce the concept of a tensor. And a tensor is the generalization of a vector or a scalar. It's a geometrical object describing a physical quantity. And because it's a geometrical object and has some real physical meaning, if we change our coordinates, then we have to change the representation of that object in our various basis vectors in a well-defined way. And this is the transformation that all tensors have to follow. And we know that we have all sorts of algebraic processes by which we can turn one tensor into another, which means we can do all the kinds of things we normally do in physics with tensors, just as we often do things in physics with vectors. We also learned about tensor fields. A tensor field is just a tensor for each point in space-time. We've already had experience of various kinds of tensor fields. Indeed, the electromagnetic field is a classic example. It's classical mechanics, that's two vector fields. We're going to see that they can be combined into one tensor field. And we expect that because we can see that in different reference frames, magnetic fields come and go. Now, we know that when we don't have forces, that the total energy momentum for vector is conserved. Now, when we do have forces, of course, we expect the energy momentum vector to change. And we expect it to change the full force, if we're going to define one, it's going to have to be the derivative of the energy momentum with respect to proper time. Why does it have to be that? Well, it has to be a four vector, so the energy momentum four vector is the obvious choice. The three force is the derivative of the three momentum with respect to time, so it has to look something like this. But we couldn't just use a normal time coordinate, we had to use the proper time because we had to make it a scalar. Otherwise, this thing wouldn't transform like a four vector. It would transform, this bit would transform like a four vector, and the time coordinate would transform differently. So this transforms correctly, so that must be what our four force is. So now, what's it going to be in terms of our electromagnetic field? We know what it has to reduce to. In terms of the three force, we know that the force on a charged particle due to the electromagnetic field is just the charge of that particle times the electric field plus the velocity of that particle crossed with the magnetic field. So we know that it's going to have to depend on velocity in some way. And we know we're going to have to have a four vector. I write it as a covector, but we can choose our indices to be up or down as we like. We know it's got to be proportional to the charge. And we know it's got to end up being something to do with the four velocity. Now we could just make it proportional to the four velocity. So the easiest way to make something one four vector related to another four vector is just to make them proportional to each other. So I could do something like this and have my electric field be just a number. Now, of course, we know it's more than just a number. So this is too simple. So we need to make it a bit more complicated than that. So what kind of object can I put here so that I can follow the rules for contracting things and end up with a four vector? Well, the absolute simplest I can do is something with two indices like that. That's the absolute simplest I can do, and that at least has enough structure in it that it can contain something the size of a vector, like a, an electric field or a magnetic field. So here's our guess, where this thing here is some kind of electromagnetic tensor. We don't know much about it. All right, let's see if we can figure out some of its properties. Let's have a look at this object here. What's that? That's a scalar, because we're summing over this index. By definition, it's this. And we know that for a massive particle, the momentum is just the mass times the four velocity. And we know that this is, by definition, just the acceleration. The mass doesn't change over time, so this is just... And in our assignments, we calculated that this was zero. So this scalar is the same in all inertial reference frames, and it's also equal to zero. So what are the consequences for our electromagnetic tensor? Let's have a look. Let's contract F with this U. So if we look at that and we force that to be zero, so we know that this part is, of course, symmetric, because we can exchange the order of those two easily. So if I just add two of these together, I'll still get zero. Remember, I'm summing over mu and u. I can relabel those to be the other way around. And since I can choose any of these I like, I can choose any choice of four velocity that I like, I know that this must be anti-symmetric. So this tensor here must get a minus sign every time you swap the indices, which means, of course, the diagonal terms are zero. So we might have expected that, because if you think about that, that means that in this tensor, if I was to write it out as in matrix form, we have four zeros down the diagonal, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six independent components here, 
and just the minus of them on the other triangle. So these two triangles have six independent components. What's interesting about six independent components? Well, that sounds an awfully lot like two, three vectors, doesn't it? Something like an electric field and a magnetic field. And in fact, if we make the following choice, then it turns out that this equation here gives us exactly the Lorentz force law. Let's check that. Now the easy limit to check this is for when our particle is non-relativistic. Anyway, let's look at one of the space-like components. So we've got, say, F1, which will be the X component. Now that's defined as, maybe we'll need a minus sign when we're going from the vector to the covector on the space-like components. And we're going to get, on the right-hand side, right, so this thing here is just in the limit that we have a non-relativistic particle and in a non-relativistic frame, then this proper time is just the normal time and this is just the normal force, or the X component of it anyway. Now on the other side we have this line and our four velocity in the non-relativistic limit again has gamma equals one, so it's just, and if we expand that out we get, which when we take the minus sign, is just the X component of the normal Lorentz force law. And of course if we do F2 and F3, we'll get the Y and Z components respectively. Let's have a look at the time-like component. Now remember, the time-like component of the energy momentum tensor is energy on the speed of light. And again, for a non-relativistic particle. And this, of course, means that the work done is going to be equal to just the electric field dotted with the velocity, as you'd expect.